So good afternoon and welcome to this Hive webinar. It's starting a co-op right for you. Uh, my name is Petra Morris and I work for Cooperatives UK. So I'm delighted to be presenting uh, this webinar this afternoon. Um, and I'll also be joined later on in the session by my colleague, Dane Hollard at Cooperatives UK. Um, so before I say a little bit more about who we are and why we're having this Hive webinar, just in terms of some quick housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available to everyone that's registered um, after the event and will also be uploaded to the website. And um, because it's a webinar, um, no one's on camera um, and we've also muted everyone. So if you do want to ask any questions, you can put those in the chat and we can try and respond to those either in the chat or at the end of the session. Hopefully there's some time for Q&A. Um, and a um, and yeah, so that's great. So we'll get started. Um, so as I say, um, I'm Petra Morris. Um, Cooperatives UK is the national membership body that represents the thousands of cooperatives across the UK. Um, and we're delighted to deliver this high webinar. It's part of a series of webinars that we've been delivering um, towards the end of last year. Um, we'll continue into February. We've had webinars focused on different audiences from young people to freelancers to those that are looking at digital platform cooperatives and community co-ops coming up as well. Um, and these webinars are part of our Hive Business Support Programme, which is a programme delivered by Cooperatives UK in partnership with the Cooperative Bank. And we're delighted to have been working with them over the last six years to support new cooperatives and also existing cooperatives um, and in that time, we supported over a thousand cooperatives. So we'll, um, I'll talk a little bit more at the end of this session um, about what um, support is available through the Hive and also through Cooperatives UK and our other funded programmes. Um, and as I say, uh, uh, towards the end of the session, um, my colleague will also, um, Dane will tell you about how to incorporate your cooperative and the different legal forms available. So in terms of this one hour uh, webinar session, I'm, I'm going to um, hopefully tell you a little about, bit about what a cooperative is. Um, and I'll illustrate that with lots of examples of cooperatives. Um, and then as I say, Dane will talk to you about incorporating your cooperative. And then we'll talk about um, how you can get further support. So without further ado, um, what is a cooperative? Well, as it says here, it's a group of people coming together to meet their common needs. And it's a business that's owned and controlled and primarily for the benefit of its members. And those members can be the customers, they can be the users, be the employees, um, they can be the community that they operate in or a combination of those things. Um, and the members, there could be three in the cooperative or there could be three million. So they range in size and nature. And cooperatives are businesses, um, but what makes them different from um, other businesses generally is that they're there to benefit the members. Membership is at the heart of every cooperative. It's why they exist. It's the purpose of the cooperative to serve those members. And those members have a democratic say in how the cooperative is run. Um, they are the owners and shareholders, and members can invest in the cooperative, but they shouldn't just invest to make money. And the members decide what to do with the profits, as businesses do aim to make profits, but it's how those profits are distributed are different in a cooperative. So in a worker cooperative, that might be about distributing the profits among the workers. Um, for a retail consumer society, that might be giving dividends to the customers. The other thing that distinguishes a cooperative from any other business or a charity is these principles. Um, these values and principles are enshrined in cooperatives worldwide. Um, they're looked after by the International Cooperative Alliance. Um, and it's really um, what defines a cooperative. Um, if you can't demonstrate that you meet these principles, then essentially you're not operating as a cooperative. Um, so I'll just touch on some of these points. Um, so the, as I said before, cooperatives are um, owned and controlled by their members and they have a democratic say in how the cooperative is run. 
Um, and members should have some kind of benefit um, and relationship with the cooperative that has economic benefit. Cooperatives, because they're acting on behalf of their members and they're owned by their members, should be autonomous and independent organisations. They are there to serve their members. And this one around education and training is really important in order for members to make good decisions and be able to run their cooperative effectively, they need the skills and the training to be able to do that. Um, so that's a big part of, of being a cooperative. And it doesn't say it here, but principle six, as we call it, is the idea of cooperation among cooperatives. Cooperatives uh, support one another and they promote the cooperative model. Um, and concern for the community is a big part of cooperatives. Cooperatives generally are quite ethical businesses. They care about the community they operate in. And when I talk about some of the cooperatives um, out there, you'll see how they have supported the community, particularly in this last couple of years um, with these uh, difficult conditions in the pandemic. Um, and membership of cooperative is open and voluntary, so you can't be forced um, to be members. So if you go into your local cooperative store, you might be able to get your membership card, and, um, but you can also shop there if you're not a member. So it is open and voluntary. Um, so as I say, this, these principles and values, um, I haven't mentioned the values here, but they're things like self-responsibility self and honesty. They really define the cooperative um, and, and those values and principles, I think, are, are what make cooperatives a really good model and successful. So talking about why you should start a cooperative, um, and I know that some people on the webinar today may not be at the stage of starting a cooperative, and some of you actually might be advisors or councils or people working with groups that might be thinking of a cooperative. So here in this slide, we're just looking at some of the reasons that we know that cooperatives are successful, and cooperatives have been around for more than 175 years. Um, so that in itself shows their longevity and, and their success. Um, but we can see from our research that cooperatives um, have a better survival rate when they first start up compared to other businesses. Almost twice as many um, continue to trade after the first five years. Um, and they are very resilient and, and flexible. And I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, but I think the idea that people have control over the cooperative um, and they have a say in how it's run makes you much more motivated. You're much more likely to take part in, in, in how um, it can grow and, and it boosts productivity. And at the heart of the cooperatives, as we saw in the principles, is the idea of doing good. Cooperative businesses are very much people businesses and they're trusted um, and they're there to support their members and often their community. So I can't really do this presentation. I wanted to avoid the C word, but um, we have been in this pandemic the last couple of years. Um, but what we have seen in terms of cooperative business is that they have been much more resilient compared to other businesses. Um, they've been four times less likely to cease trading in, in 2020 compared to businesses more generally. Um, and throughout the pandemic, they've been much more ambitious and effective and have continued to grow and increase. Um, and I think that's really, again, about the idea that they're there for their members. They can be flexible, they can pivot. They're not in there for short term profits and external um, shareholders. Um, and, and, and I think this demonstrates why cooperatives are so successful um, and, and are a good model. So this slide really is just showing that cooperatives in, exist in all sectors um, of the economy, everything from food and farming um, to retail and digital. Um, they operate at all different sizes, um, and altogether, these 7,000 cooperatives contribute nearly £40 billion pound to the economy, um, UK economy, and that has been rising um, every year, and more and more cooperatives are being set up. And, and certainly, again, during this last couple of years, I think we've seen um, a re more revived interest in cooperatives as a better more ethical business model that gives people control over their lives. So cooperatives are collectively owned and they're democratically controlled. And that's really key to what makes a cooperative different from any other business. And cooperatives have continued to be relevant throughout the ages, um, from the very first cooperative store in Rochdale in 1844, 
through the 70s when there was high employment and continue to be relevant today. And this next slide just talks a little bit more about that relevance and why we keep promoting cooperatives as hopefully better alternative. So we know that there are lots of things that affect our daily lives and society. And one of those is the access to decent and quality housing, particularly for the younger generation. We also can't have missed last year the emphasis on climate action and the need to take action um, and COP26. And this is not ne necessarily a negative point of view from the customer, but um, at a click of a button, everyone can order their food, their taxis, their travel, but there can be a downside to that for the workers. It's precarious work, often not very well paid work. So we at Cooperatives UK and with our partners and with our co-ops are trying to find better alternatives. And for instance, there are hundreds of cooperatively owned housing out there, um, affordable housing, quality housing, often very sustainable housing. And it's not about just making short-term profits and investments. We also have hundreds of community energy groups that are um, doing projects around hydro and solar and, and looking at saving the planet essentially and retrofit and, and, and everything else um, and having a real impact on um, energy. And through um, the Hive business support program, we've been developing a program called Unfound. And this is helping new cooperatives to set up in the digital sector um, where the members are both the users of the services, but also the workers, so it should be more ethical and more fair. Um, so it's just really demonstrating that cooperatives um, are really trying to find better alternatives to the things that are important to us in our working lives and our lives more generally. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about some examples of cooperatives. And I started this presentation by saying that cooperatives are owned by their members and they're there to serve their members. And those members can be the customers, the users, the employees, the community they operate in, or a mix of those as in multi-stakeholder co-ops. So these next slides, are, I'm just going to talk about some examples of cooperatives and who they're owned by and, and why they were set up. So I think I mentioned at the start and everybody's probably familiar with their cooperative convenience store um, on, on their corner um, and may have their membership card and receive their dividends. Um, and Scott Mid Cooperative is one of the largest independent cooperatives in Scotland, um, given the name. Um, they've been going for 160 years. Um, and like many big retail consumer societies, particularly in the last couple of years, um, through the pandemic, they're there not only to, to serve their customers, but also, also their communities. So lots of our big consumer societies give funds to charities and, and help their communities. So it's much more than just being a retail store. Um, but essentially, they're, they're owned by, by the customers and the members, and they can be elected to councils and boards and have a say in how that cooperative is run. So it's very democratic. Um, I put the Wine Society in there just to say it's not all about convenient shopping and, and cooperative stores. Um, the Wine Society, as it suggests, is a wine club. Um, they have 90,000 members. They've been going for 130 years. Um, and I guess you get good bargains on the wine, um, which is distributed from all over the world. So it's just a different example. So on this next slide, I wanted to talk about worker cooperatives um, and lots of worker cooperatives are set up basically because the workers want to have fairer work and have more control over how they operate. Um, and they tend to be operated on fairly flat structures, not much hierarchy, um, and they tend to be quite successful as worker owned. So there's a couple of um, worker um, cooperatives on this slide. Um, Unicorn Grocery um, celebrated 25 years uh, last year in 2021. Um, they are a um, whole food store just outside of Manchester in Cholton. Um, they've grown their turnover now to eight million pound and they have just over 60 employees um, and they're worker owners. And so they all take different roles in, in the store, not just on, on, you know, in the retail part, but they might be involved in, in management and 
websites and everything else. So um, it's it's really about the workers having those roles and responsibilities, and then hopefully reaping the rewards of a successful cooperative. Um, and just to say that not all cooperatives are about food and retail. Um, in fact, Digital are a small worker co-op that we helped to set up through the High Business Support Programme. Um, and they're based in London and they're, um, there's only about three members um, and they provide services around websites and digital. And they really wanted to come together as a cooperative. They were kind of working on that. Um, flat structure anyway, but the cooperative formalised that and, and they feel um, much more confident um, in the way they work now, much more motivated now that they are a worker cooperative. Um, so there's, there's hundreds of examples of worker cooperatives, we can't touch on them all, but essentially what they have in common is that idea of democratic control, less hierarchy and really doing business on a much fairer basis. Um, and again, we've seen in, in the pandemic that, you know, some big businesses have been big, big, very quick to make people redundant and there's, it's all quite precarious out there. Um, and so having that control and, and security in a worker co-op is really important. So I touched on um, the fact that there are these um, digital platforms out there that allow us all to get access to services on, on in a digital way, a click of a button. Um, and these are two examples of cooperatives that have set up um, to be much more ethical um, and um, reduce those inequalities in, in the services that are provided and also for the workers. Um, and they work, you know, um, as a digital co-op. So Sinalyze is a cooperative, again, that was, both of these were supported through the Hive, um, and the members are the deaf interpreters um, and translators, and also the community that benefit from, from those services. Um, generally in that sector, the um, translators would be working through agencies, and uh, you know, again, work could be quite precarious, and the quality was never at the forefront. So, so having a cooperative where both our members means that they can do that in a much better way um, and do that democratically. Equal Care Cooperative, similarly, uh, they um, set up um, about four years ago and they are providing social care. And again, both the caregivers and the care receivers are members of that cooperatives and they can kind of co-produce um, how the business is run um, and make it much more effective. So these are just, again, different examples of how cooperatives can be set, set up. They're really flexible models and, you know, you can have lots of different kinds of members that all care about how the business is run. So I'm just going to very quickly touch on housing. Um, I mentioned before that there are lots of cooperative housing. Uh, Lilac is an example in Leeds. It's very sustainable um, housing. Um, and that's owned by the members um, and has been very successful. Uh, they have about 20 eco builds and been going for about 15 years. So it's just another example of the type of cooperative that can be set up. And Student Cooperative Homes is a sort of federal body for any students that want to have access to more affordable accommodation. We often see that students in the hands of private landlords and uh, rents can be quite high. So this is just a way of, of um, allowing you know, students access to better quality accommodation that they can control and also gives them access to uh, life skills and business skills in running that cooperative. So moving on, um, this is an example, another example of the types of cooperatives that can be set up. Um, these are what we call community cooperatives. Um, and when Dane, my colleague, talks to you about legal forms, generally most of these will be set up as what we call community benefit societies. As the name suggests, they're set up to benefit their local communities. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of those, which is actually um, my cooperative. Um, so when I'm not at Cooperatives UK, I'm also a member and a board member volunteer at um, Friends of Stretford Public Hall. Um, and this is a beautiful uh, grade two, two listed building just outside of Manchester. Um, and we took ownership of this building from the council 
back in 2015, um, and it's now owned by the investor members. There are 800 of them um, in Stratford. And in 2015, sorry, in 2017, we ran something called a community share offer. And I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, but essentially, it's a way that members of a, of a society of a cooperative can raise funds um, to allow them to do the things that they want to do. Um, it's patient capital. Um, and by raising these funds, we were able to renovate the ballroom and the hall is used for all kinds of activities, um, from community events, well-being, weddings, um, you name it. Um, so it's just an example of a cooperative that's there to serve the community that it's operating in. Um, and at the other end of the scale, um, the Bell in Bath is a um, pub with live music, um, which was taken over by the community when it was um, going to close. Um, and again, they did a share offer um, in order to do that um, and are owned by their members. So these are just examples, different examples of cooperatives. Um, and sorry, what I should have said as well about Friends of Stratford Public Hall is that idea of cooperatives being flexible and being able to change how they operate. So in the last couple of years with the lockdowns and everything else, we've not been able to be open to the public for events, but we have pivoted as a mutual aid organisation and have supported the local community and food banks and, and other support. So I just want to very briefly touch on community shares. Um, just mindful of the time. So community shares is um, a unique way of societies, of cooperatives raising funds. Um, people can buy shares and they can't trade them, they can't sell them, but you can potentially earn some interest on them um, and you can withdraw them at some point. Um, it's almost like making a donation, but by buying shares, um, you then have some democratic say in how the cooperative is, is run. So lots of communities, across the country, hundreds of them have saved their local assets or their services by raising funds through community shares. Um, that figure is now out of date. I think it's now 180 million have been raised from investors, um, from over 100,000 investors. Um, and we have another programme called Community Shares Booster Programme that supports people who are looking to do a community share offer. So that, that gives you an introduction um, and an overview of the lot lots of different types of cooperatives and how they're owned by their members and why they've set up their cooperatives all for different reasons and motivations. So um, it, just to summarize, cooperatives are businesses. They do aim to make profits, but what, how they distribute those profits might be different. They operate to a set of principles um, and there are lots of different types of cooperatives, not only by sector, but by how they are owned by their members. So if you're thinking of starting a cooperative, um, it's much the same as starting any business. Um, hopefully you'll, you either have an idea that you think will work or an opportunity. So again, with Friends of Stratford Public Hall, because the building was going to be sold by the council, um, there was an opportunity for the community to come along and take ownership. So sometimes it's just an opportunity, but sometimes it's just the fact that you want to have some control over your work and, and, and run your business yourself, um, such as um, with, um, in fact, digital. And what we would recommend, of course, is that um, if you think you have a solution to a problem, you need to test that out and check the feasibility and make sure that that is the case. Um, and you need to think about, do you have the skills and motivation and the capacity to take this forward? Um, and is what you're proposing better than what other people are doing? So much the same as any other business in that sense. Um, but then obviously you need to think about who your members are going to be um, and why they're going to benefit and be part of your cooperative. Um, and that's particularly important because a lot of businesses are just set up by a sole trader and then they might um, take on staff and they can make all those decisions. But in a cooperative, um, because there's more of you, you really need to agree that collective vision, which everyone buys into. Um, and that collective vision is, is, you know, first and foremost, what the cooperative is about, um, rather than your own needs as a member. 
Um, and that vision leads to the objects, and those objects are important because that will then determine what's in your governing document. Um, and yeah, um, so once you've got that agreed, you can think about setting up your cooperative um, and then think about what, what legal structure that might be. So I'm just looking at, oh, so this slide is really helpful because all of those things I talked about, about before in terms of setting up your cooperative and testing your idea and thinking about how to raise funds and doing your business plans, we have a very helpful step-by-step -step guide on our website um, that takes you through all those processes, there's lots of templates and resources, um, and then eventually you can also register your cooperative. So I think that's essentially where my part of the presentation finishes. Um, I'm going to hand over to my co colleague, Dane Pollard um, from Cooperatives UK, who's going to take you through the legal forms. Um, and then hopefully there'll be some questions that have been put in chat, I can't see the chat, um, that we can respond to at the end or, or take those questions at the end. So I'm, I will be moving the slides on for Dane as we go along. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so over to you, Dane, thanks very much. Thank you, Petra. Um, I can see, before I start, I can see Vanessa raised their hand uh, earlier. So Vanessa, if you wouldn't mind putting your question or your comment in the chat, um, we'll we'll answer that for you uh, as soon as we can. Um, we'd, ideally, we'll answer all the questions at the end, um, just in case we cover some of the bits that you may be asking in the question. Oh, she said it was an error, so no problem. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, thank you, Petra. As she said, my name is Dane Pollard, and I work in the advice team here at Coach UK. Um, we're a relatively small team, um, but we do cover a wide range of skills and experience, uh, mostly in governance and HR advice. And my role specifically is um, primarily to assist new organisations incorporate, uh, and this involves discussions around legal forms and structures, uh, which is why I'm here doing this part today. So um, the first slide for me, please, Petra. Um, we're going to start right at the beginning of the journey, which is basically uh, to incorporate or not. Um, most co-ops do incorporate, but there are circumstances where uh, remaining unincorporated is actually uh, most appropriate, certainly for the short term. So what does incorporation mean? Well, incorporation means creating a legal identity for an organization that is distinct from its members. It then becomes a corporate body. And as the slide says there, it then limits the personal liability of your members and directors. And it's the legal entity um, which is a person in the eyes of the law that takes on any risk for that organization. If you remain unincorporated, your organization is, is more informal in the eyes of the law, um, which means uh, the law will see your cooperative as a collection of people and not a legal entity in its own right, which means the organization itself can't enter into contracts because it doesn't officially exist. Uh, and it's more difficult to give members authority to enter into those contracts uh, on the organization's behalf. And liability to the directors is joint and several and is unlimited. And that means that these liabilities might not um, be shared equally among the members as well. And it's often those who have the ability to pay are the ones pursued more for the uh, payment of any debts. It's worth saying here as well that contractual liability will ultimately rest on those who have uh, authorized a contract. So for instance, if a committee member was to enter into a contract, and the contract was authorized by the management committee, each committee member would be held liable under the terms of the contract should something go wrong. If a committee member acts on their own without the authorization of the committee, then they can be held personally liable. Obviously, incorporation creates uh, limited liability, but a director can still be held uh, liable if they act outside of the authority of the board. When you do incorporate, it means that your business will have specific rights and duties to follow. Uh, you'll become a legal entity under a particular uh, act, a piece of legislation, with a regulatory body such as uh, the company's house, and that would be the Companies Act 2006. And what this means is you will have startup fees, um, more likely. And if you're doing it uh, yourself, you know, they, they might be quite minimum, but if you're getting someone to help you do the, the whole startup process, you'll obviously have to pay for that service as well. Uh, you'll then have to keep and file records with the, the appropriate registrar and make certain details public, such as registered addresses and uh, board and director names. So when should you incorporate? 
Well, if you plan to uh, own property or enter in significant contracts, uh, such as employment contracts, if you undertake significant trade or uh, you need to own significant assets, or you just want to limit the personal liability of, of the members um, for debts and things like that, the legal, legal entity then takes on that risk. Being unincorporated, though, might suit your co-op if you have a more informal setup and your exposure to risk is minimal. And the advantages of remaining un unincorporated are uh, there are generally no limit uh, or limited startup or annual costs, and you don't need to declare any details with public registers. And there's very little admin, really, apart from, you know, what you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis for your business. If you want to explore more around uh, legal forms and structures, we do have a helpful publication called Simply Legal. And you can download that from our step-by-step -step guide that uh, Petra mentioned earlier. And in particular, it's at step 5.1. And it's also important to say that you shouldn't rush into incorporation if there is no need to at present. Some businesses can start off informally and take along quite nicely without the need for big contracts or employees or anything like that. Um, there are pros and cons to incorporation uh, and Simply Legal goes into a bit more detail for those as well. A couple of highlights just to mention, though, is, is that admin factor and the privacy factor. So more admin once in incorporated and less privacy. But when the time is right, make the change and you'll have a better idea of what your co-op will look like too if you've been sort of trading informally for a short while. Uh, move to the next slide, please, Petra. Thank you. So we'll focus on the incorporation side of it now. Um, and once you've made the decision to incorporate, you're going to go through a series of just uh, um, of, of, of other decisions to make, really. So if you want to be a cooperative, you need to decide your co-op structure, which is what Petra was talking about earlier, the different types of co-op. Uh, do you know who your members are going to be? And do you know what their relationship will be with the co-op? So Petra mentioned quite a few types of co-ops there. Um, and you can have many, many different types of co-ops, really, even within those sort of categories that was mentioned, there are different structures of those. So it's important that you pick something that is going to suit you and the business and your members uh, the best. You're going to need a business model and a business plan, and the co-op needs to have that business behind it. If you want to be a successful co-op, you need to be um, an established and hopefully successful business as well. So what is your mission and vision? Uh, why are you starting the business in the first place? What need is there out there that you'll be addressing? And possibly most importantly for the uh, sustainability of the business, where's your income coming from? Where's the capital coming from? Will you be reliant on trading income or grants or loans? And especially at startup, what do you need to get things off the ground, including those uh, registration costs? Then you'll decide on a legal form that suits you uh, and your needs. Research all the different ones, uh, and I'll go through a few of them in a bit, um, and pick, again, pick the one that, that suits your needs best. Um, in the UK, uh, cooperatives don't have a single legislation that covers them. Uh, so what that means is it's the governance layer, which makes you a cooperative, and for that reason, you can be any legal form. Uh, once you've chosen your legal form, you'll want to draft or adopt a constitution. Um, and if you want to be a cooperative, you'll need those cooperative values and principles uh, entrenched in that constitution. So when you get your governing document sorted, uh, think again uh, about what you need to be successful. And Co-op UK has model constitutions that will suit all legal forms. And again, you can find examples of those and you can download them on our step-by-step -step guide. And then once you've done all that, you need to make your application to the relevant registrar. So depending on what legal form you've chosen, there might be a different registrar. And again, we'll touch on that in a minute. Cooperatives UK does have a registration service that is currently being subsidised by the Co-op Bank. Uh, and as part of that service, we will help draft the constitution, prepare the application form and liaise with the registrar on your behalf till that co-op is registered. And we'll even add in membership to Cooperatives UK at no extra cost should you wish to join us. You can start that journey if you want to at uh, step six of that step-by-step -step guide, um, which we've already mentioned how useful it is. There's almost everything on there that you'll need. Uh, and at the moment, there is a flat fee of £150 for a new registration. So it's, it's really good value for money. Uh, next slide, please, Petra, thank you. So we'll start with the last point on the previous slide, which is about the legal forms. And um, 
as I mentioned, a co-op can be any legal form. So it is important to have a look at the differences between them uh, and find what you need. Some things will require a certain legal form, but in some cases it will be down to personal preference or, or choice. So the main legal forms that we see are, are on the screen here. Some of the ones we don't see as much, but uh, company limits by guarantee and shares are probably slightly more familiar to those who aren't in the cooperative sector. Um, and the other main legal forms that we see with co-ops are uh, cooperative societies, community benefit societies, and some of those community benefit societies are charitable as well. Other legal forms which can still be cooperative or have cooperative values and principles involved are the, uh, the kit companies, the community interest companies, again, limited by guarantee or shares, a CIO, which is a charitable cooperated organization, a limited liability partnership, which can still be a cooperative, and a PLC, which is, is rare to be a co-op, but um, technically it could be if you wanted to. So things to think about when you're choosing your legal form is what type of business your co-op will carry out, who the members of the co-op will be, uh, and their interaction with the co-op as well. How will you fund the co-op? Certainly at the startup stage, what will co-op do with any profit it makes? And what will the co-op do with its assets if it winds up? Next slide, please, Petra. So we'll go into slightly more detail, but I will. it will be a whistle-stop tour here because obviously we don't have the most amount of time today and it can be a complicated structure um, set up as well. But if you do want to ask any further questions, feel free to email advice at uk.coop or, like we said, visit our step-by-step -step guide. So at first glance, this probably does look a little complicated, um, but don't worry too much. It's an illustration of how all the legal forms are interlinked and how they differ. For example, on the top, uh, you can see the legislation for those particular legal forms are registered under. Uh, we have the Companies Act over there on the left, uh, which is probably the most familiar, and then the Cooperative and Community Benefit Society Act uh, 2014. And at the end, there's a limited liability partnership. So companies, the more familiar one, they are limited by guarantee or shares. Usually uh, non-co-ops will just probably register a company limited by shares, even if there's only one or two directors there. Uh, we often see cooperatives use the guarantee model more, um, but the difference is uh, the guarantee model means that all the members guarantee a certain amount, which is usually a pound. And in the event of the company being wound up, that was what they would contribute to the outstanding debts. Private company limited by shares means the liability of the shareholders to the creditors is their uh, capital that they've invested. So the nominal value of the shares and any premium paid in return for the issue of those shares by the company. So all their shareholding, essentially. There is a PLC on there as well, like we said, but, um, but we don't see that. And that's more like your, your larger firms on the, on the stock exchange. So moving on to the societies there under the uh, Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act, um, they are corporate bodies in exactly the same way companies are, but they're registered under that different act. And they are administered uh, by the Financial Conduct Authority, who are registrars as opposed to uh, sort of regulators. So they do have certain powers, but they mostly just register and, uh, and keep the records uh, of societies. You can register as a society, as a cooperative society, or a community benefit society, as the app suggests. The cooperative society form is used by cooperatives, obviously, and to meet the conditions for registration, the FCA state that the society must be an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned enterprise, which essentially is everything that Petra described earlier, but uh, into a nice long sentence for you. Um, and the Cooperative Alliance, the International Cooperative Alliance, um, have written that statement as well. Community Benefit Society legal form is more common um, amongst the community-owned businesses, so community co-ops, uh, and other forms of voluntary and community, activ community activity, where the emphasis there is on the wider community rather than the individual members of the society. The Community Benefit Society also has the option of adding an asset lock, which also community interest companies uh, must have. And an asset lock is designed to ensure that the assets of the organization, which are profits and surpluses generated by activities as well, are used for the benefit of the community. And on wind up, it means that any remaining assets must be given to another asset locked organization, usually with similar objectives. And what that means is just so that the members don't necessarily take the assets on, on a wind up, um, on, a, on a dissolution. 
But once you put an asset lock into the constitution, it can't be removed. So any new businesses should really think about the advantage and disadvantage of, of doing that before you register. As I said, we also have LLPs there, which uh, can be as little as, as two people, which can still act cooperatively. Um, but if they want to be a partnership, um, which is, is usually more for profit making activities, um, it can still be a cooperative and do that. And the community interest company, uh, which we also mentioned, is similar to the Community Benefit Society in that the emphasis is on the, uh, the wider community and the public. And again, they will have the asset lock in. It's not a choice with this one, it's compulsory. With the CBS, it's a choice. The, um, the kick company as well has to pass the community interest test, which is um, the kick regulator who will judge what your activities are uh, and to make sure that they actually do uh, benefit the, the community. And then the, uh, the CIOs are in there as well. Um, but, but we don't often see those uh, as co-ops, even though you could act cooperatively under there. So the last thing I want to mention on this particular slide is the, uh, the circles on the right-hand side there with the cooperative and the uh, community benefit societies. The, um, this means that you can issue withdrawable share capital. And uh, issuing share capital in a society is optional. Societies are limited by shares in their nature, so you have to have a minimum of one share, but it is optional to add into the governing document to issue more shares. And this type of share is withdrawable by the member and um, subject to conditions stated in the rules and any share offer document. There's no requirement to specify an amount of share capital on the registration. It can be as many or as little as you like. And societies have some exemptions from the Financial Services and Markets Act uh, 2000, which include exemptions for covering the approval of financial promotions, uh, which again can reduce costs of share issues and can allow you to sort of widely advertise uh, share issues. It is still risk capital though, um, despite the exemptions, the FCA will expect a society to provide appropriate information regarding any risk to potential members who are investing in the society. You can pay interest on these shares. However, that interest um, must be set at a rate to uh, that that the FCA describe as necessary to obtain and retain enough capital to run the business. So it can't be seen as a money-making opportunity, basically. People investing usually do so in societies for socially motivated or philanthropic reasons rather than the prospect of financial return. And it's certainly something the FCA do look closely at as well on application. There's lots more to talk about with withdrawable shares, um, but you should probably visit our community shares unit pages on our website, on our website, uk.coop. And there is a, a community shares handbook on there, which has got a really useful function, uh, a search function to find specific topics. And of course, you can email the community shares unit for more information too. And the last slide from my section, Petra, is basically a pros and cons list. Um, which again, as I said earlier, it, it can be down to personal choice, but there are certain reasons why you might go for one form over the other. I've kept it to companies and societies here because they are the two main ones that we see. And this is a really quick example. Um, uh, there'll be more on each side of those tables, I'm sure. And through lived experience, you probably find more, uh, but these are just the ones that stick out really. So the regulatory report in there with a the society, um, is, um, it, well, it's easier to register with a society, I should say first, uh, sorry, not a society, a company, it's easier to register with a company because it's quicker and uh, essentially Companies House will just register you if you are submitting the right documents, whereas um, a society, the FCA, do look at your uh, your business plan sort of thing. They, they want to know what you're doing as a co-op or a community benefit society first. Um, there is more uh, admin on, um, on a company's house because you have to update company's house every time you change directors, for example, and other things like that. Whereas with a society, you just update the FCA once a year in your annual returns. The company is a more recognized legal form uh, generally out there. So banks and insurance people, so other established um, agents that you might see and funders, they, they seem to be more uh, familiar with the company model. However, that's not to say the society model isn't known. It's just not known in certain circles as well. And what that does sometimes is pose a problem because people 
aren't willing to explore what the society model is. They just have a, a flat response. So it can be more difficult to get certain things done. Um, but you should be able to get everything done unless the terms and conditions of that particular organization say they don't support societies. And um, the company has slightly more prescriptive legislation as well, um, which can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. On the one hand, it uh, it backs up all the, uh, the sort of terms and conditions around being a company. But on the other hand, um, it means, you know, it's written there, so you have to do it. Whereas a society has a lot of legislation that you have to follow. But then uh, if it doesn't specifically say something, then it's up to the rules to then define that. So um, it, it can be easier to function on a day to day basis for the board sometimes. Um, Although on big issues, it tends to fall back on the company law anyway, so you have to be careful with some of that as well. Uh, and finally, it's it's more difficult to demutualize a society. Um, but if you have entrenched your provisions into a company, you can make that quite difficult as well. So that's that's down to the, the constitution, really. Uh, and that's about it in, in general there. Um, so I think, Petra, I'll hand back to you and then see if we've got any questions from anyone coming in. Thanks very much, Dane. Um, that's a great overview of whether you should incorporate and the different models that are available. I think the key takeaway from that is that you can essentially be any legal form and still be a cooperative. It's really the values and principles that make you a cooperative. Um, and as I say, the decision on the legal model um, is based on what kind of business you're running um, and the purpose of it and who you think your members might be. Um, so um, I just wanted to flag this uh, starter cop um, step-by-step guide again, because you can go through all of those and help you decide what would be the best um, ownership model and therefore the best legal structure. And then at number six, that's where you can actually register your cooperative um, uh, for that subsidised fee of £150, which also gives you access to membership of Cooperatives UK, if that's useful. Um, so thanks, Dane. That's a really uh, comprehensive overview of, of the legal structures. Um, so I'm just going to uh, finally talk about the next steps um, and where you can get more support. So if you are thinking of setting up a cooperative or maybe you're an existing business that wants to convert to a cooperative, um, this is where you can get support, the High Business Support Programme. And I think we have links in the chat as well where you can uh, click on. Um, this is our programme that's delivered by Cooperatives UK in partnership with the Cooperative Bank. You can apply for up to 10 days of consultancy, support, mentoring and training to help those early days of setting up the cooperative or, or convert your business. Um, and that's a, a, you know, a competitive application process um, that's open um, all the time for you to apply. Um, you can also get support from our advice team at Cooperatives UK. Um, we do lots of training as well around HR and finance and governance. Um, so check out our, our training sessions. Um, and the advice team are there also to help you on your journey to register your, your cooperative. As I say, Cooperatives UK are a registration body. And we mentioned as well the Community Shares Unit. Um, we also have a fund called the Community Shares Booster Programme for anyone thinking of doing community share offer. Um, and there's lots of resources and, and support on, on, on that website as well. So all of those links hopefully have been posted in, in the chat, um, but you can also email us if, if you need anything else. So I think that um, kind of complete, com completes um, the presentations. This, this link is, is really a useful link. You can go on that um, and all of our funded programs um, for new startup cooperatives are on there and lots of resources. So do, do check that out. So I'm just going to look to my colleagues to see if we've had any questions um, yeah. and then um, see if we can answer them. And we've got about just checking the time, about 10 minutes left. So um, we'll try and pick up any of those questions that were posted in the chat. And if you still want have some questions, you can continue to post those in the chat and we'll either pick those up now or yeah. we can come back to you after the session. So We've got a few, Petra, so hopefully we'll get through um, as much of these as possible. So uh, Nadine asked that some members will be... Um, of a potential court will be vulnerable as maybe su survivors of uh, domestic abuse, for example. Um, and the question is, do the names need to be shown with company's house um, due to their safety? So in, if they're a director and the dean of the co-op of the company, they, they will have their name on 
company's house. If they're a member, you don't have to have the members register on company's house, so you can keep that private. So we're thinking about there. There's similarly with the FCA, if you register a society, you don't necessarily have the director's names on the mutuals register, but they will have to be in the annual return. So you can find them effectively through a downloadable PDF, but they're more hidden than they are with a company. But I would say if there are people vulnerable who just don't want the name out there at all, then maybe try and not have them as directors, even though that might not be the route they want to take. I um, hope that answers there. Uh, Tom asks, what are the best ways to find a technical co-founder, uh, preferably someone open to the cooperative business structure for a digital platform co-op? Um, I think, Tom there, I don't Petra, if you'd agree, but I think, yeah, you can. I was going to say, I think you probably want want someone with you at the beginning, really, to start a co-op. But um, Petra, do you know of any anywhere that they can maybe collaborate and hopefully find like-minded people? Yeah, so if it's particularly in the digital sector, we have something called um, COTEC, stands for Cooperative Technologies. It's kind of a network um, of um, members, if you like, who all are in that area of tech for good. Um, and we can share that that uh, link maybe um, afterwards. Um, but yeah, you could search for Cotech. Um, so that would be a good way to um, engage with um, people with similar ideas to you. They're all most of them are cooperatives themselves, but they definitely are kind of um, in that mode of of tech for good and you know wanting to do uh, digital work in in that sense. Um, but yeah, just use things like um, I always suggest new groups maybe use. Facebook or Instagram or whatever um, social media to kind of see what the interest is and, and, and reach out to people in that way. But but yeah, it's always best to start with at least um, a couple of you um, initially to to um, yeah get going. Is that Dave? Does that sort of fit with what you were saying as well? Yeah, I think so. And maybe sort of start finding people in a similar field first that you you know you might do the same work with and then speak to them about the cooperative model because they might never have heard of it before so perhaps trying to find someone interested in the co-op model might be more difficult than trying to tell someone about the co-op model so if you find someone who's uh, in the same sector and doing the same work as you um you know mention it and see what they say uh, but hopefully you find someone tom and, and we hear from you soon um vanessa said will the slides be shared uh, i believe we're going to share the slides are we petra Yep. Yes, so these recorded slides will be shared and they'll also be uploaded to the website and so that people can view them later. Uh, Naomi says, what's the registration cost difference between a company and a society? Uh, Naomi, if you come in via Cooperatives UK, uh, there's no difference. So because the co-op bank are subsidising all the fees at the moment, it's, it's a flat 150 to everybody. And that includes statutory fees and VAT in that as well. The only reason that would uh, increase from Cox UK is if it became overly complicated or protracted or um, you wanted to make more than six changes to our governing documents. If you do it yourself, there's a huge difference in cost. Um, you effectively can register a company um, in the next 20 minutes on Companies House for about £12. Whereas if you went to the FCA, firstly, it'd take you a bit longer, but you'd also cost you £950 because you're not using a sponsoring body who's already pre-written that model uh, governing document, that constitution. So, yeah, um, we would always say come to Coach UK because obviously we, we draft these documents and we know how to change them uh, to suit your needs if that's necessary as well. But with a company, you can technically do it yourself if you like. Um, but yeah, the society way will save you a lot of money coming through us. Um, Tiago, I hope that's how I pronounce it, uh, has said, from your experience, what are the biggest failure points for co-ops, Petra? <laughs> um, gosh, that's a big, big question. <laughs> <I know. laughs> that's why I said you. Um, <laughs> you yeah, that. I mean, I suppose what, what I was saying earlier in my presentation is that cooperatives actually um, have demonstrated that they're much more resilient and long-standing and, and and the success rate is, is actually higher and, and less, you know, particularly in the last couple of years, it's um, I've ceased trace, trading. Um, I suppose it's like any business that you set up, you know, businesses are set up by people, people can fall out. And a lot of the advice that we give at Cooperatives UK is around how you govern your um, cooperative and how you do your collective decision making, um, because, you know, it is de democratic and it's not just one person making those decisions. So we do provide lots of resources and training around that so that you can effectively run 
your cooperative. Um, and I suppose from a business point of view, you know, like any other business, a business can fail if it can't get the funding, if what it's delivering, you know, doesn't meet the needs of the people it's delivering for, um, you know, all the usual reasons. Um, but what we have found is because cooperatives, you know, do this collectively and they have more than one person, um, they can kind of share those risks as well as the rewards and, and make it more successful. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, you know, it's not to say that cooperatives don't, don't fail, um, but they probably fail on the same reasons that any other business would fail. Um, does that, is that a fair response? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I would agree. Um, Jeff, thank you for reminding me there. There is a secure register on Companies House uh, for, for, for those who don't want their names there. So uh, apologies about that. We've, um, yeah, we, we don't register as many companies as we do societies and that one slipped my mind. So yeah, I think in answer to the question earlier, you, you should be able to find a way to be a director and not have your name visible. Um, but we're more than happy to look into that for you if you came through our, our services and, and see how that, how that works. Um, so we had a couple more questions quickly. Uh, Stan said, uh, looking to set up as a sole trader, but can I build it in setting up co-op as part of the business plan? Um, as would like to make it a social enterprise. You can absolutely build it into your business plan, um, Stan. I would say if you're going to be a sole trader at the moment, you possibly don't need to fully incorporate as a company or society, depending on what you want to do. Because if you wanted your constitution to have cooperative values and principles in it, you're likely to need a minimum of two people for that to actually not be in breach of your own constitution immediately. So by all means, set up as a sole trader and have a, a business plan that says, you know, within six, 12 months or whatever, you want the people involved to become members. Of course, membership is open and voluntary, as, as Petra said. So you'd have to get like-minded people, I suppose, on board. But by all means have it as an ultimate aim, you know, and review that aim as you go along. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Liam said, uh, having worked for both large and small production companies, I'm exploring the options of setting up a media production company. However, there seems to be a lack of organizations uh, as co-ops. Are there many examples we can provide? Uh, Petri, do you know any media production companies off the top of your head who might be co-ops? Yeah, it depends what you mean by media production. But yes, yeah, certainly yeah. in membership, we have lots of um, digital and creative co-ops and Blake House are filmmakers. I think there's one in Scotland. So, yeah, we can most certainly put you in touch with existing cooperatives. In fact, the sort of where we have most applications to the high tend to be in the digital creative and media sector. Um, so um, you know, I think lots of them do set up as worker co-ops. So, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely find some examples for you and share those with you. Brilliant. I think that's about it, really. Um, Jeff helpfully uh, posted a link. So thanks again, Jeff, for highlighting that one. Um, if any, anyone else has got a question, quickly jot it in there or just type yes while, while you're typing the question. Um, but I think we're about done on there. I can't see any more, Petra, that we've missed. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm looking at the chat as well now. So, um, yeah, so as I said, um, if... Um, we will share the recording um, and we'll also say in the email, one of the things I'm offering is if anybody wants to have a short um, call with me, if they have something in mind and they need a little bit more help before they maybe apply or, or think of setting up their cooperative, that's something I can arrange. Um, but do look at the step-by-step -step guide um, and, and the startup pages. Um, everything you need is, 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 is there. So I hope, hope you found today's webinar useful. It, it um, obviously didn't cover everything you need to know about setting up your cooperative, but hopefully it's a, a good introduction. Um, and as I say, there's lots of support either at the end of an email or call or on our website um, if you want to take it any further. Um, so if there doesn't appear to be any more last questions, I think we'll, we'll close it there. And uh, thanks very much for everyone's time and for attending. Um, and good luck with your journeys if you're on them. Thanks very much.